I hated being a secretary. I left those bosses behind. I'm not looking for another boss on the road. You've read too much trash. Your head's in the clouds. Welcome to the Magic Lantern Podcast, an ongoing informal discussion of the films we love and the things we love about them. I am Erica Long. And I am Cole Rolaine. Each episode of The Magic Lantern will be devoted to one film that we alternately select and we will discuss why it is significant to us. Just a note, whether the film is a classic or a more contemporary title, this will be an in-depth discussion that will include explicit plot details and potential spoilers. We are at episode 162 today. We're back to Erica's Choice. What are we talking about today? I picked the feel-good hit of the summer, <laughs> and that is Vagabond from 1985, directed by Agnes Varda with Sandrine Bonaire. It's the story of Mona, who is found frozen to death in a ditch, and the film is largely told in flashback and pieced together by people who encountered her in the days and weeks leading up to her death. Now, if you happen to have, like we do, the wonderful, complete Anya's Varda set, the theme that the film is organized under is No Shelter. Now, we also have the original French title of Vagabond, and that is Sans Toi Ni Loi, which means with neither shelter nor law. And it's a play on a common French idiom, Sans Foi Ni Loi, which is neither faith nor law. So there's a lot to consider here. Do you have a favorite title of those choices? I'm always inclined to go with what the artist intended, and that is the French title that Varda gave it, with neither shelter nor law. I prefer that. You get the play on words. You get her full intent. It helps you understand the film a little better. I am 100% with you. Now, watching this film and Cleo from 5 to 7, and then looking at bits and bobs from her other films, it really strikes me that there is no form that Agnes Varda won't try or incorporate or experiment with. I don't know if you phrased it this way, thinking back to what you just said, but I think we are incredibly lucky to have that set. And while I haven't gotten all the way through it, I've seen most of what's in there. And based on what I have seen, I think you're exactly right. She just comes across as a master of multiple styles and techniques. And beyond just that willingness to experiment, I think, is the one characteristic that pulls it all together for me. What really makes it work for me is that you pick up on her personality through that prism. It's her personality that drives all that. Even with the darkest material in the set like this, there's a bit of a playfulness when it's appropriate. And I think that's a really welcome factor because that introduces an intimacy and an empathy that I think goes through everything she makes. She doesn't maintain an objective distance, which is the opposite of what some people would say you should do when making documentaries like she does, but I'm glad she completely foregoes that old school way of thinking and injects herself into everything. Well, I don't know about you, but none of it feels forced. It feels deliberate and chosen. And we talked about Anya Zvarda back in our episode 128 on Cleo from 5 to 7. So we won't do a ton of that necessarily here. But to me, like you say, she manages to seem completely spontaneous and curious, but completely prepared. And her storytelling capabilities and that visual flair, those just can't be matched. Now, I made a comment in the last episode, My Brilliant Career, about Gillian Armstrong, that how few contemporaries she had to kind of compare or aspire to, and Anya Zvarda had to be one of those. She had to be a huge inspiration. So are you ready to get into the film? Yeah, always. Now, after that haunting theme of no shelter, there is certainly no shelter to be found where we see the body. This is where the girl we will come to know as Mona is found. It's winter, and she's in wine-harvesting country. She's completely alone. What hits me first is that she really does look dead. Her body, that stiff face, the positioning, her lack of covering. And then the framework of the film begins to reveal itself. It unfolds in this mix of flashback and documentary and narrative style, as people are interviewed by, or turned directly to the camera, 
talking about what they remember about Mona and their feelings about her or what she was. Now, the bulk of these stories will be from men. We've got a few women dotted here and there, and they're very important. It's clear as we begin here in the countryside that no one is a friend. When they utter that line about, oh, they put her in the wine barrel, I didn't know what that meant at the time, other than thinking about true crime, which you know I'm pretty preoccupied with right now. We have to wait until the very end to understand that implication. We just see that her skin is definitely discolored, but why would she be in a wine barrel except for anything other than nefarious purposes? But anyway. So I mentioned here that no one is a friend. No one seems particularly upset that she's gone. Do you have a sense that the countryside would be just more welcoming? No, absolutely oh, not. Oh, okay. No, I don't feel that way. It does start, like you say, with this beautiful, spare, poetic shot of the countryside. But we talked about this during our discussion of L'Argent. Nature is where the true violence is. Now, I don't always necessarily expect that of it. I'm not watching Bertrand Tavernier's A Sunday in the Country thinking, okay, when's the bloodbath about to start? <laughs> but it does not surprise me when things go that way in an obviously natural setting. I think I had the idea that the people would be somehow more welcoming, which that's really based on nothing, too. Have you not seen the Texas Chainsaw Massacre? Yeah, you're right. I have. Thank you, unfortunately, because of you. <laughs> but here she is referred to really almost as a creature than as a person. She's not quite trash, not quite a pest, but she's certainly not a young person who would be in need of help or shelter in their eyes. She's not one of them. She's not from the country. So I don't get the feeling that she was ever taken in by some lovely country family. It's not a room with a view. There are no charming villagers with big smiles waiting with open arms. So then we see her alive for the first time, and it reminds me a bit of the beginning of Blue Ruin, the washing in the sea. Did that occur to you at all? No, something else occurred to me, which goes right in line with what you're saying about her not being accepted necessarily by the rural villagers that she runs into. I don't think it's necessarily as much a thing of her being an animal or subhuman. It's an other. And that's established for me right away by this thing you're talking about. This, to me, felt more mythological, almost, like a Venus emerging from the sea. Oh, interesting. It is imparting something about her that's almost elemental. So this introduction, it goes a long way to establishing this feeling that I think that you're having too, that we haven't ever seen a character like this before. And this is why, at least partly, no one knows what to do with her. Does it make a difference to you that this is happening in winter? Do you feel her death or her life any differently? It definitely does. And I love this choice of setting. Cold is my favorite thing. I'm so hot natured that all I want to be is cold all the time. So this is an enticement into the story for me. This darkness, this cold, that's where I am at my most comfortable. Though I know that might not be the same for everyone, but it makes everything sharper. It feels like every emotion, every movement is so much more distinct because of that cold. There's an urgency to things that you wouldn't have if it was a lazy summer afternoon, for instance. And then symbolically, absolutely, it couldn't have been any other season. It's the end of the cycle. The reaping is over, and now we wait for the mercy of spring, hopeful that we have laid enough resources aside to make it through this darkness. Spoiler alert, we have not. And then while we're talking about this larger type of symbolism here, I wanted to mention something else. I don't know if you noticed this or not, but I want to talk about her movement. Anytime we see her crossing an expanse or covering a lot of ground on foot, at least, almost inevitably she is moving to the west. She is moving right to left across the screen. And I know it's not a surprise since we first encounter her as a corpse, but throughout the film she is relentlessly moving toward that sunset, that final act. Did you also point out to me back in Van Diemen's Land that that right to left is kind of counterintuitive? It means we're moving backwards almost? Yeah, we talked about that quite a bit, screen direction in Van Diemen's Land. It's very interesting in Van Diemen's Land how they use contrasting movement to establish different things for different characters all in one huge shot. Yeah, it's beautiful the way they use that. 
I really had not noticed that spatially happening, but it definitely comes to mind when she meets up just sort of casually with the sex worker. That's where it really keys in for me. Well, the winter time definitely makes a huge difference for me, but for completely different reasons, I think. Summer can be fun. In summertime, the idea that there might be work, and then by extension, money, seems a little bit easier. You can keep moving more easily, but winter in the country? With no heavy coat or hat, what is there to do? I don't know, that sounds like a dream. You're talking to a guy who in Oslo in February was just wearing a hoodie. Yeah, this trying is to, all cold relay. You're the only one. <laughs> travel on the road in the summertime sounds like a nightmare. It's nothing but swamp pants. <laughs> Gross. Okay, let's move on from there. <laughs> she doesn't care about this because her first words are, I am. She is so definite. She reminds me of what we talked about again during my brilliant career. She's like one of Gillian Armstrong's unapologetic women. She is an entirely different creature from Cleo, for example. She doesn't look like the need for apology would ever occur to her. She seems to feel entitled to be able to move around exactly as she pleases. Yeah, it makes perfect sense. And then the way that I talk a lot of my brilliant career up to Judy Davis, it's the same thing here with Sandrine Bonaire. This is inspired casting, I feel like. So much of this comes from her. And I feel like this character has even less to apologize for than Gillian Armstrong's heroines. Some of Armstrong's characters, they are specifically pushing boundaries, maybe occasionally creating instances where they were in the wrong, but for a good reason. Mona simply wants to be left alone. She's happy to accept a good turn as long as there are no strings, but she is willing to work for her daily bread. She is harming no one. But her presence, just the state of being, really causes a lot of people to think. One of those first stories we get is from a couple who interacted with Mona, and they talk about the idea of being free. So, is freedom just another word for nothing left to lose? <laughs> <laughs> or is it something else? And do you personally, Cole Rolaine, yearn for this kind of freedom? Well, here we come back to another sentiment that we found in my brilliant career. The price you sometimes pay for your independence. There are those, when we hear these interviews, that admire and envy what they perceive as her freedom, but I don't think of it that way. I actually don't think that type of freedom exists. So no, I am not looking for that in particular. I fully recognize that you are beholden to someone unless you can literally produce everything you need to survive. So there are trades and compromises that you have to make. And I think these characters that are being interviewed that are so wistful about it, they are obviously idealizing what she is going through at least a little bit. They are thinking of it counter to the less than satisfying lives that they're leading right now. Yeah, I do respond to the concept that I think the woman is expressing about being unfettered by the things that seem destined to confine us or specifically define our destiny as women. Right. So I think in this particular case, I still go with independence. I think that's a better, more accurate phrase than freedom. And while we're talking about these early reminiscences, I wanted to bring up another one that I really like that sort of goes hand in glove with the one that you're talking about to establish more of the totality that I'm talking about. There's that one interview to start with that we don't necessarily initially notice is taking place on a freight train. And when that train lurches into motion unexpectedly, it's jarring. It's almost like a physical manifestation of waking you up from your reverie, reminding you what this lifestyle is like. Enough yapping. We got to keep moving. That's with David, I think. Mm -hmm. I like that one too. And it shows you these different paths that are possibly available. Now, I just have one thing to say before we keep going, and really, it's just a statement. The score is amazing. Yeah, rarely does a score do everything that I need it to do so beautifully like this. This jars me, this jangles me when it's supposed to, it soothes me when it's supposed to. That dissonance scratches a very specific itch in my brain. I don't know if everyone has that, but I feel like the music is absolutely necessary. I was thinking, again, for you specifically, Cole, this would be one that you could just have on oh, listening to. Definitely. It's not as much 
hornets in your brain as say Johnny Greenwood's score for There Will Be Blood. Right. But it's close in that type of mm, this is just uncomfortable enough to be perfect and pleasant. Now, when I first saw this, and you mentioned this a bit earlier, Mona for me was just unlike any other protagonist that I had run across. Do you have any analogs that I'm just not thinking of? All of the examples that are even tangentially similar that immediately come to mind are so much more severe, I feel like. The first thing I think of is Charlize Theron in Monster. Oh, okay. I never would have gone there. But that is a character years down a much darker road than where we find Mona now. So no, not exactly, but I can see how a character like this might evolve into these other more extreme characters should she survive. Yeah, I was racking my brain and I couldn't come up with anybody because she's not humorous. She's not a charmer. She's not necessarily sexual, even though I think you made an apt description with calling her Venus for the elemental part, not the sexuality. I'm going to keep coming back to that kind of idea. And she's just so young. I just really can't think of anybody. Now, I want to read from something that... Andrea Klein from the Paris Review wrote about this character when we're talking about possible comparisons. A male drifter is doing penance for something for which he was found innocent, but for which he cannot forgive himself. A woman alone is crazy. That she is not a sex worker makes her crazier. She has no purpose and she is serving no one's needs. Something must have happened to her, as in Wendy and Lucy. Or she must be the victim of something, as in Wanda, which we've covered on the show. Or she must be on a prescriptive journey of self-discovery with a discernible end and a scheduled return. Think wild or eat, pray, love. That last category, I think I have the least amount of patience for in all of cinema. Middle-aged white ladies patting themselves on the back for figuring out something that the rest of us learned in high school. Get out of my face with that. Did I mention I'm going on a surf yoga retreat, though, coming up? (laughs) I'm with you. But I also think that that definition of the male drifter is a little too narrow. And someone like you, who has owned an incredible Hulk TV tray since you were a toddler, you're obviously acquainted with another facet of the male drifter, the one that's not necessarily innocent, but harbors a dark side that he cannot control. God, I loved that TV show. (laughs) It spoke so deeply to me as a tiny kid. Yeah, like Mona, like Bruce Banner, like you now. Just want to be left alone. Just don't bother us. Now, I've got one that I think maybe you haven't thought of. Okay. And that is naked when we talk Ah. about that other side of the male drifter. I did think about that as I was putting these notes together, but it seemed a little different. I didn't necessarily want to include it in this discussion for the main reason that one of these days I am doing that as a full episode. I can't wait. Um, (laughs) It's really about that unapologetic side of that nature. And I think that there is a repulsive side to naked as well. And so that leads me to my next series of questions. I wonder if I think that because of his gender, but I don't think that about her, do I give him less grace than I give her? That's so hard to compare apples and oranges, though. She's so taciturn. She doesn't speak as much. She's not as verbose. She's smart, I think. But she's not this fire hose of wit like David Thewlis' character is in Naked, so that's such an impossible comparison to try to make for me. Well, I want to keep talking about gender because that was really the thing that hit me most in every single viewing, specifically with this character of Mona. So to me, she is basically genderless. It is other people who seem to insist that she emphatically be a girl or a virgin or a whore or whatever. But to me, she is never an object to be gazed at by this camera including the washing in the sea. And it doesn't seem like she sees herself as an object to be judged by a feminine lens at all by the other people around her. But am I alone in this? No, I don't think so. I think all of these characters are obviously bringing their own preoccupations and preconceived notions about all of this to bear on the conversation because one of the interviewees says, for instance, that female drifters are all alike. 
And like almost everything else that anyone says about her, that is woefully inaccurate, both just in general and especially the way it applies to her. She likes to eat, but she's always willing to work. And she has other appetites too. We see a brief tryst here with a mechanic. In retrospect, do you think this is one of those trades? Is this a transactional exchange that's happening? Or do you think this is just sex for recreation? How did that feel once you thought about it? I think I thought of it as recreational. There are different moments throughout where she takes some pleasure in companionship, but it doesn't feel like this is a woman and a man coming together. Yeah, I think we're totally on the same page with this. I'm with you. I classify these as all simply very human behaviors. Thank you. I think that's a much better way of putting it. I'm not trying to suggest that she's asexual. It just is sexuality as a difference between gender. I think these preconceived notions and prejudices that I was talking about, that is why people may balk at what they see here, because these encounters are happening pretty much on her terms. Again, does envy motivate some of these reactions like that? And it is notable, I think, that it's most frequently the women being interviewed that express either admiration or affection for her. The men are either a little standoffish, at best neutral, at least the majority of them, sometimes hostile. Now, Sandy Flitterman Lewis, in her essay in the Criterion blog about this piece, she mentioned a specific theme of the work as being a woman's place in today's complex and unresponsive world, which I am still having a really difficult time with, specifically the woman's place. Now, you're having a hard time with it in the sense that there's not a real answer or the answer is that you have no place. What's the struggle with that? The struggle is I'm thinking like Mona and I don't think she would characterize it as my woman's place in the world. It's my human place or really none of those things. Sometimes I wonder if she's even aware of this gaze that wants her to be a woman and act accordingly. I think she's at least mildly aware of it or previously was aware of it because in part that may have been what spurred her to make this move in the first place away from the nine to five world. I tend to think of her as a genderless person in a gendered world, I guess is what it comes down to for me, but I'm going to keep harping on this. So <laughs> bear with me as we keep going. Now, speaking of purpose though, do you think she has a purpose other than moving? Do you think she has a plan? At the point at which we find her, no and no. And I think that that's just fine. Sometimes we are just ruled by instinct. And if that instinct tells you to move, you move, whether or not you are in the best position to do so. But yeah, she has no plan. She definitely doesn't want to put down roots. Growing potatoes, obviously, is too much of an obligation for her. Too many eyes on her. Get it? Potatoes. Eyes. <laughs> Oh, I love you, honey. Now we're about to get to one of my favorite sections here. We meet Yolande, who is the caretaker of an old woman, Lide. And Yolande is the niece of a man who watches over an estate, as well as being the girlfriend of a petty criminal. And she's played by Yolande Moreau, one of the few people in the film who are professional actors. Now, I know that you are a huge fan of non-professionals, and this seems like a really interesting mix of the two. Why do you think Agnes Varda went in this direction, using Yolande Moreau or Macha Merrill in key roles? Is it because of maybe some of the heavy lifting that they're asked to do? Sometimes you just need these anchors. If you have a Jenna Rollins, for instance, that's holding down the fort, then it grants a little more leeway for everyone else to cast about until they can hit what works. And there are some key elements where you literally see this grounding effect. When Macha Merrill and Sandrine Bonaire are sitting together, holding their hands as if in prayer in one of these moments, it brings all the proceedings down for a moment. And I don't mean bums you out or slows down the movie unnecessarily, but it focuses and calms everything. And notably, Mona breaks that posture first. And then that is soon followed by Macha Merrill's near electrocution. And this is a huge moment. The regret that she exudes in the wake of that is something that I think a non-professional might have had a hard time mustering so readily. 
Yeah, I like the mix. I even like how the mix is used with what I was talking about earlier and how the witnesses speak directly to the camera like Yolande does, for example, or someone else will speak to the cops or these different ways of conveying information like Madame Landier does over the phone in the bath. It's just not a single way of doing things. So as we continue to see reflections of this character through the eyes of others, as viewers, we see these different versions of what Mona could be. None of them are great, in my opinion. It largely seems to fall into drudgery as a woman or a woman as an object of a man. But they all definitely want her to be doing something other than what she is doing. So go be a cleaner or a wife or a caretaker or whatever. But outside of the professor, there's nothing particularly grand to aspire to. So is there any place to just be where there aren't rules or something to trade in exchange for doing what you want? One of the very first and most valuable lessons I ever learned from the movies is when W.C. Fields taught me that there's no such thing as a free lunch. And I mentioned this briefly earlier. You would just have to be in complete isolation, basically. Until then, the strategy is you just keep moving and you minimize your obligations and responsibilities as best you can and then enjoy the rare luxury of getting to stay in one place for a few days whenever that comes up. There's certainly no lovely park in summer to go hang out in. You just have to keep moving. And so the shepherd, the most loathsome character in this or any other film that I can think of in recent memory, asks, is there any way to survive on the road? The implication being without loneliness or addiction or abuse. Of course there's a way. There's always a way. That people don't find that way, I think, speaks more to their flaws than the non-existence of that option. Especially with this jackass. He is projecting like crazy his own failures. It's luck too, though, I have to say. You're playing some long odds putting yourself in this position. She knows her way around, at least somewhat, but that is still sometimes not enough to protect people who are living on the margins like this. To me, it's all about other people in this instance, because she becomes prey to all three of those things. And by prey, I mean, she's not necessarily the one feeling those things, but she has to pay the price for the feelings in others. And I think this is just where her age is so poignant here. The road has tons of dangers that she just cannot fully grasp. Now, I talked at the very beginning about this idea that I sort of had of, oh, the country's all going to be Mayberry and everyone's friendly, but almost no one knows her name or even asks. Why do you think that is? That just comes with drifter territory, I think. That is just a tale as old as time. You look at Clint Eastwood's Man with No Name, for example, and how iconic that type of drifter character is. And I think it's a 50-50 proposition character-wise. No one cares enough to ask. And equally, she doesn't necessarily broadcast it. Anonymity is just another tool to reduce these obligations, and it works out just fine for both parties this way. Yeah, I think she doesn't take it upon herself to feel the need to be friendly or personable, for example. She doesn't volunteer any of this. I'll be gone in the morning, so what does it matter? I've got just another observation here. I don't think I've seen, again, anything in recent memory that made me feel with the loss of something like a zipper or a button or a closure can mean. These things are just so integral and it is dire when they are lost. And not just integral, but intimate objects too, I feel like. Those become almost like your protection charms when you're out living on the road like this. I don't know if you're the same as me, but when we go to places like Uncommon Objects or other places that sell antiques or have these sort of stalls with just old knickknacks and cast off items, all of that stuff is so melancholy to go through. These lost buttons, these hooks, these zippers, they almost carry a similar emotional freight as when you're looking through a box of cast off photographs. You can invent a story for every one of them. That just choked me up a little bit because I'm thinking sadly and I don't want to necessarily get into it here, but a specific exhibit of a specific time in a specific museum, and it was shoes that were mm. left behind. Oh, yeah, it's terrible. 
Well, my next question is not going to brighten the mood. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think this was her first and last winter on the road? I'm thinking about her happy face in the tent when the first snow falls versus the end of the film. I do think it's her first and last winter on the road. And I like that you bring this up. You mentioned the contrast of how she looks at the beginning and the end. Both of those things bring me back to what I think is the most important idea expressed by any other character. At one point, one of these men says to her, you chose the road. And it's true. And it evokes such a wide array of feelings when you apply it to these instances. When you look at her and think of that when she's so happy. When you look at the end and how all this has turned out. Anywhere along this path, you can apply that phrase and it brings something completely different out of the film. It's an admonishment. It's congratulatory. It's just matter of fact. It's all kinds of things. Well, I made up a whole backstory for her. And to me, it is definitely her first winter. I think also it's just her first time on the road. I think we're really only seeing her maybe a few weeks into the experience. I think she left in a fit of anger. I think she may have a place to go back to, but not a person or a family. I think for her, she was planning it as an adventure and she was going to carve out a space for herself on her own terms. So what do you make of this really interesting thread of big connections in people and stories? And that's Yolande, Madame Landier, and then her assistant Jean-Pierre. I really enjoy the inevitability of all these threads coming together. Landier is obviously my favorite. Jean-Pierre is such an insufferable twerp. Yolande is just so unmoored from the reality of her situation with her delusions of eternal love. I don't know what to do with that character. But the one thing that ties them all together for me is that they all have so much that they need to learn from Mona, whether they realize it or not. It is so interesting to me that she has crafted this incredible narrative that doesn't necessarily relate to our specific vagabond, but their lives are so interconnected in ways that they just don't know, and Mona stumbles into them. And it makes for five interesting women. Mona herself, Yolande, who is this pawn and just wants the love that you were talking about, Madame Landier, who has a full life but is so incredibly affected by Mona, Lydie, the old woman who Yolande takes care of. She has that great afternoon with Mona. And then Jean-Pierre's wife, who is the instrument that throws out Yolande because she wants her own space. Of all of these characters, do you find Jean-Pierre's wife to be the most opposite of Mona when we're trying to analyze these characters and where they fit on the spectrum in terms of who they are, what they need, how they define being a woman Yes, and then still have the same underlying aim. They just put different words to it. Well, we are coming to the convergence of all of these stories and her end, essentially. Do you find this kind of descent into drugs and even potential sex trafficking to be quick or inevitable? I don't necessarily think of it as either one, especially inevitable. I think that you can do it, like I said, and avoid that path. But when you are mixed up with this kind of person, it's obviously a lot harder. These no good punks. I hate characters like this. I have absolutely zero patience for dumb types of criminals, the breaking windows because we're bored kind of criminals. And we've mostly avoided seeing her being preyed upon. The threat, though, is ever present. And the one time it does happen in the forest is galvanizing and terrifying and awful and immediately after it's obvious that something has changed within her if only for the first time when we see her walking we can't see her face she's walking up screen north essentially where we cannot see her face at all and therefore cannot see in her facial expression how she is processing this and what she might be thinking it's only body language and it's only denial of access to that for the audience to me, I would say a little bit of the inevitable because you have to accept that a wrong turn, whether you've made it or not, is not recoverable after a certain point. And then no one sees her last moments except us. It just makes me very sad every time I see it. She didn't go out on her terms. I think the fact that no one sees that but the audience is the single most important choice that Varda made in this entire story. Well, that's the end 
a vagabond, but we still have some things to discuss. So let's get back to Anya's Varda for a second. Now, talking about the structure of this film, she said, So what makes Citizen Kane so interesting is the way Orson Welles tells us about the man, intriguing us about what people think about him. She said, we don't really know so much about him. There's not such a huge plot. It's a refraction of that image. I would say that this does that even better than Citizen Kane in one very specific way. The fact that none of these pieces these small things that people remember add up to her at all. At least some of how they describe Kane are accurate portrayals of certain facets of his personality. They say she had a natural death. I think nothing could be further from the truth. Nothing that these people say indicate to me that they understood her even in the slightest. What I mean that it does better than Kane is that it presents that and it's so frustrating and yet compelling at the same time. I don't feel a similar frustration with Kane's interviewees. I don't want to grab them by the lapels and say, you just did not look at this woman. So Varda moves me a lot more in that regard. What if Agnes Moorhead played Yolande? <laughs> that would actually be pretty good. I know. Or what if she was Lydie? Early period or late period Agnes Moorhead would be a great addition to any film. Now, speaking of, because this is the answer for my question, do you have a favorite episode? For me, it's The Afternoon with Lee Day. It's just how much fun they have. Since you took my first choice, I'll give you a second one then in that case. Because, yeah, that was definitely mine too. They are kicking up their heels. They are having a grand time. And finally, somebody has actually looked at Lee Day and actually listened to her. But aside from that, I like the period with Asun when she seems most content. But when he makes that offer to take care of her, it's done. You just know it is. It's a precarious balance that she needs to manage all the time, making no demands, there being no implications of a power imbalance of any kind. With Lee Day, you definitely don't have that, for sure. So we've talked about the incredible sadness of her last moments and how we see them. Do you think there's an underlying comment on her death? That kind of death? Or is there a comment about... The link between her death and her character? Do you mean that in terms of it being a punishment for failing to live up to societal norms? It's kind of the art house equivalent of teens being murdered for having sex in a slasher movie? Right. Or do we as society need to reflect back on ourselves? Because my first reaction was that her death was done to her. I don't see it that way. You know how I think about these things. So I'm much more inclined to see it as you win some, you lose some. If you choose a hard road for yourself, you are not always going to make it. But I see the mechanism of this entirely as a series of choices that she makes with no influence other than her own. She has decided this. She has set this in motion. She has ridden it through to this particular ending. It's not going to always go this way. Just unfortunately, it did this time. So because of where we are, do you think this is a uniquely French story? Not necessarily, I don't think. I think about it from the other end. It's not essentially French, but the touches that come exclusively from the geography make an indelible impression. For instance, there's a moment early on when she's trying to eat some really, really old stale bread that is just not working. So you know it's a bad day in France when you can't even count on a baguette. And then there's that metaphor of the rot in the trees that is very specific to the location and the influx of American GIs and the way it's taken a toll on the French countryside. And then one little weird touch that I really like, her bag with that varsity style letter on it, it seems like such an American touch. Yeah, I thought it was the University of Michigan. That's all that I could see. Meaning that she picked up these things in thrift stores on her way. And you mentioned Asun. There's the whole issue with the specific workers that come and where they come from. But yes, I think this could be anywhere. I think it could be told anywhere. So then, how do you perceive this Vagabond story compared with other of our favorite more road films, like those of Vim Vendors? Well, I love it because it's different. It's harsh and solitary compared to those, but I like it specifically for that reason. But it does have some of the same spare poetic quality to the way the shots are presented, to the language, to the obvious intellect that drives the whole thing. I think... 
with the Vim Vender stuff, for instance, and other road movies that we enjoy that are more lighthearted, it's companionship that makes a huge difference in most of those. Bon ami, as the French might say. Well, it made me think of Travis from Paris, Texas, not the same kind of character, but a bit of a similar motivation. And then all of the road trilogy. Do you think maybe she was a semi grown up Alice? In my heart, I hope that Alice never goes down that nine to five work a day road. I don't see that happening. I see her doing something much more exotic and exciting and never locked into a thing that she just despises. I think she and Zazie Don Le Metro got together somehow and went and had a good time. They're jet pilots like Maverick and Goose. <laughs> or they run Makes their sense. own carnival or yeah, something yes. super fun. Much more like that. Now, thinking about the face and the form of Mona, how realistic do you find Sandrine Bonaire's portrayal? Including her age here, she was just about 18 years old. It's perfection. When you see what she does through her teens to early 20s, she carries all that off with such conviction. And I think one of the important things to this character, she's a beautiful woman. She's attractive underneath all that grime in a way that makes it super realistic to see how she can move between these worlds with minimal effort, I think. She can quote unquote make herself presentable and play along with people at that level if it's necessary to get by. She has this bravado and sureness that really comes through. And I just love that at that age, her face is still kind of unformed. She's not the woman that we will come to know later. Okay, so I think this is the last time I'm going to ask this kind of question. And we probably have already answered this, but do you think viewers struggle with her? Do you think they wish she were a man or wish she were a different woman? I think a lot of them might. I think you're right. And I think it's reflected, like I said, in the way that these witnesses remember her. All of this conjecture about her fate, everyone completely misapprehending her. I'm sure just by law of averages, there are some Jean-Pierre's in the audience. So when she asks, do I scare you? Some of the audience has to say yes. And like you mentioned before, so much of it is just her presence. More specifically, what her way of life then makes them confront about themselves. And this is a thing that I understand on a very specific level when it comes to the straight edge thing. It's not something I advertise, but my entire life, when I am at a party, just being, it makes some people supremely uncomfortable. And they respond in all kinds of ways. Some people insist I have a drink, or at least hold a drink, which is utterly baffling to me. Some of them, they tell me unprompted how they wish they could do what I'm doing. Or some just avoid me. And all I am doing is nothing. And that nothing forces them to then think about what it is that they are doing. And that makes them unhappy or uncomfortable. They don't like it. And obviously this is not everyone, but at least one person, literally at every gathering of any size I have ever been to has done this in one way or another. It never fails. So on a much larger philosophical scale, this is what her way of life is making them think about. Her nothing is an indictment they think of their something. These parties, though, are you just staring at people when they ask? <laughs> Walking around knocking <laughs> drinks out of people's hands. <laughs> what? I didn't do anything. No, I'm just hanging out. So one of these witnesses, do you have one that you especially respond to? Yes, in the absolute most negative way. This awkward encounter <laughs> yeah. with the goat herd. He wants the freedom to just be a creep, I guess, is the freedom that he's looking for. He is projecting all his failure onto her, and I hate, I cannot tell you how much I hate that he is right about her eventual fate in this case, and I will never forgive you for making me voice that character in the opening scene. Sorry. Did I do that? Sorry. <laughs> okay, now, back to the sad questions. When you first see her, did you make an assumption about her death? Because I assumed it was murder. This obviously appeals to my true crime bent. I think I went farther than you did when I first saw her. I thought raped and murdered is probably ah, okay. what I guessed. Yeah. It's just a steady diet of having consumed those things. It's like how you know, or at least I know, if you're ever jogging and you see that thing in the field, it's never going to be just a mannequin. But it's interesting, I guess, how I process that versus how you may process it versus other audience members, because all of us are dealing with this idea of the trauma of finding a body. Well, at any time during the movie, did you forget that she was actually dead? 
Oh yeah, often because she's such a force when she's alive. But in the end, I always come back to it, especially when we start to see her break down, reaching that point at which she must decide to continue on at the risk of her own self-destruction. The tip off for me when I know we've reached a point of no return, I don't know if it's the same for you, is when Asun is going to take her away at the request of the other workers that have returned and she's so angry and she wants to stay. And I feel like she's fighting for something that she doesn't even necessarily want. She would have never asked for this. Or if she does want it, then I think something has radically shifted within her. The fight in her is gone. And that is something that you absolutely have to have to live this way. That defiance is a critical component of your survival. And then we get the old tubercular cough, though, and we know this is a done deal. Well, she's kind of placed her objects inside that room. She has to know it's going to be getting colder. For me, I remember when her boots start to fail her. But I definitely forgot she was dead. I got lulled in by that happy face in the tent and her hanging out with Madame Londier. It doesn't take much, though, to shock me back to the truth of the story, because when we see her at the end, she is obviously completely deteriorated. But thinking about the true crime thing, it just brings me back to the way we're looking at this and keeping her alive in our minds for so long this way. What mystery is it that we're trying to solve? What are we trying to figure out about her? Since we know the ending, it has to be more than just how did she die? What are we trying to glean from this review of her life? I think it's what do we see? Do we ask the question, how do we take care of, or should we take care of, people who don't want to play by the rules, quote-unquote? Do we make up these rules? Why do some people decide to strike out on their own? What does she want? Will she go back? I think that may be the saddest part for me, too. You mentioned you built a backstory for her. I did a similar thing, and I have a similar detail in mind where she does have a place she could go back to if she just asked for it. But she doesn't. Which leads me to my last question for you, her ending up this way, does she give up or does she just give out? I'm not sure because we see her shivering there and I have to wonder how many more conscious moments she had after that. I still think she's fighting a little bit. Interesting. I'm the exact opposite. I feel like she just gave up and it happened so quickly that she couldn't accurately identify what was happening to her even as it was happening. Well, it was a tough watch. It's always going to be a tough watch, but an extraordinary one. Funny, the more I watch it, I don't think I feel that way about it. I go into it each time thinking, okay, this is going to be harrowing. But it turns out in its own way to be so thoughtful and beautiful that by the time I get to the end, I don't feel like I've been put through the ringer the same way as something like A Woman Under the Influence, for instance. That's very true, but we do have the ending, so it's never not going to be there. Well, you know what is always going to be here? Recommendations. What do you have for us this time? Okay, I'm going to say one thing before we get into my choice, Cole Rolaine, and that is Tough Bananas. <laughs> I've picked something that we've already discussed here, because if I say it enough, you might finally watch it, and that's La Ceremonie from 1995, directed by Claude Chabrol, with Sandrine Bonaire and Isabelle Hubert, about a friendship formed between two misfits that becomes absolutely deadly. Erica says, check it out. Just because you're recommending it a second time, I think I'm going to just dig in that much harder. No, you I'll watch it. jerk. <laughs> okay, now, I came with a backup in case I'm just not allowed to do that. The in case that's say. just right out. It's not allowed, so how about your backup? <laughs> I picked... Monsieur Ear, a 1989 French drama directed by Patrice Leconte with Michel Blanc as a recluse who becomes fascinated with his neighbor, Sandrine Bonner. He's accused of murder because his neighbors think he is strange. And if it reminds you of a Georges Simenon story, it's because it is one. Panique. It sure is. Very similar storyline. You can think of it kind of as a revised version or another version of that film. Okay, how about you? Well, I feel like I'm going to do a similar thing to you. Do the same thing, because anytime we talk about Varda, the answer is always more Varda. And I'm going to recommend Faces Places from 2017, 
And that's a documentary directed by Agnes Varda and the visual artist J.R. in which they travel around rural France creating portraits of the people that they meet and then sharing their creative experiences. It's just such a great encapsulation of all of those beautiful personality traits that I was talking about at the beginning of the show. She's so charming and impish and warm, even in the face of obvious health issues. She makes it so easy to see the value in forging human connection as they travel around. And these portraits they make turn the everyday into the heroic and monumental in ways that you just can't imagine till you see them. And we also get further evidence that Jean-Luc Godard is a jerk. And none of them deserved this sweet angel in the French New Wave or Left Bank movement. Once again, that's 25 Great Recommendations, La Ceremonie, Monsieur Ear, and Faces Places. And that brings us to the end of episode 162. A special thanks first and foremost this time to Joachim Berger and Hilda for becoming our newest Patreon supporters. We appreciate that very much. If what we do here is valuable to you and you would like to support that, we would certainly love for you to check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash magiclantern. The $5 a month level gets you access to a big backlog of bonus episodes, and those come out on the Mondays alternating with regular episodes, so you never have to go a week without new Magic Lantern in your life. If you would just like to get in touch with us, you can reach us via email at magiclanternpodcast at gmail.com. We are on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Just search for Magic Lantern Podcast on any of those platforms. We are on Twitter, at Lantern underscore cast, and I just wanted to take a second to say thanks to everyone who has shared the show or given us feedback since last time. Keith Rich, Greg Nordland, Chris Polizza, Spencer Seams, Andy Wolverton, and Joe Turner. If you're sharing the show or talking about us, please make sure to tag us so we can say thanks. You can find our show on Audible, Amazon Music, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher Radio, Spotify, just about anywhere you get your podcasts, you can find us there. If you'd like to leave us a rating or review via any of those services, we would certainly appreciate that. And finally, you can find all of our episodes, including supplemental material, at the website, magiclanternpodcast.com. And thank you for listening to the Magic Lantern Podcast. 